Welcome and thank you everyone for joining with us today for our webinar, NASA Tools and Resources for Coastal Restoration and Management. On behalf of our presenters and all the staff here at Ray, I'd like to thank you for joining us. Before we begin the presentation, I just have a few quick announcements. First, you have all been placed in listen-only mode. So if you're having any technical issues or problems, you can press star zero for operator assistance. Secondly, we are recording this webinar session and both the presentation slides and the webinar recording will be posted on our web, web page following the webinar and a link will be sent to all webinar registrants. Following the presentations, we'll have a moderated Q&A. So at any point throughout this webinar presentation, you can enter a question in your question box in your webinar panel. And we'll work to answer as many as possible following the speakers. If we don't get a chance to answer your question, you can email us. Look for contact info provided at the end of the webinar. So with that, we'll go ahead and give a little bit more background information about what brought us here today. For those new to Restore America's Estuaries, a quick background on who we are. We are a national nonprofit dedicated to the protection and restoration of our nation's bays and estuaries as essential resources for our nation. And to do this, we lead an alliance of 10 conservation organizations across the U.S. coast. We run, we run a few national programs, including National Estuaries Weeks, uh, Blue Carbon, and Living Shorelines. And we host a biannual conference, which is the largest gathering of the coastal restoration and management community in the country. And we're excited to partner with the Coastal States Organization for our upcoming conference in December 2018, which will be held in Long Beach, California. Our call for proposals are now open, so if you'd like to submit a presentation or a session or poster, or if you're interested in being an exhibitor, you can visit our website at estuaries.org summit to find out more information, including how to submit an abstract. With that, I'd like to introduce the topics and speakers for today's webinar. We are excited to be partnering with the NASA Goddard Applied Sciences Program. My name is Stephanie Simpson, and I'm a Senior Program Manager at Restore America's Estuaries, and I'm joined by Dr. Maggie Hurwitz, a Deputy Director of Applied Sciences at NASA. We'll be your moderators for today, and we have a great lineup of speakers, starting with Brock Blevins, the Training Coordinator for NASA Applied Remote Sensing Training Program, who will be giving us a summary of NASA's capacity building and applied remote sensing training programs, and an overview of training materials useful for restoration planning and monitoring. He'll be followed by James Acker, Senior Support Scientist for NASA's Earth Science Data and Information Services Center, to give an overview of NASA's online Giovanni system, which provides data visualization and analysis for NASA observational and model data. He'll be followed by David uh, Lagamassino, who's an Assistant Research Professor at University of Maryland. David will be speaking on the role of long-term remote sensing data um, and how that can play a role in categorizing gain, loss, degradation, or recovery of coastal wetland systems. David will be followed by Mark Simard, a senior scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, who, pr who will present on recent multi-instrument campaigns in the Mississippi Delta region to map fluxes of water, sediment, and carbon. And finally, Dr. Nima uh, Palevan, a research scientist with NASA who will present on satellite-based near real-time monitoring system for water quality monitoring. So we're excited to have this great lineup of NASA speakers and with that I'm going to pass along presentation control to Maggie to tell us more about the NASA Applied Science Program. So Maggie bear with me one moment and you should be receiving control now. Thank you so much, Stephanie, and thank you for having uh, our colleagues from, from NASA Goddard and JPL to talk um, during this webinar. So I'm the Deputy Applied Sciences Manager at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, and my job is to coordinate all of our applied sciences activities, and those are our activities within the Earth Sciences Division that have uh, direct societal benefits. And as you might imagine, that's a pretty broad uh, range of activities, from disasters to the connections between air quality and health, uh, water resources, we have a new food security initiative, climate applications, urban environments, and another uh, working group on mission applications, um, looking at the societal benefits of our satellite missions. And we also work with uh, 
the NASA Applied Sciences Program Capacity Building Program, and you'll hear about one of those today. Um, so I work uh, to coordinate our, our Goddard community here, here at this uh, particular NASA center. We also work across NASA centers on um, activities like water security and food security that I mentioned, and, and um, looking at the sustainable development goals. And we also look to develop uh, um, relationships with partners and end users and decision makers, just as we're trying to do today with our participation in the webinar. So thank you again for having us. And I think we'll go on to our first speaker, who's uh, Brock Levins, um, to talk about NASA's RSET program. Okay, thank you. Hello, my name is Brock Blevin, and I serve as training coordinator for NASA's Applied Remote Sensing Training Program, or also known as RSET. First, uh, I'll just give you a brief overview, and Maggie alluded to this uh, as well, uh, of some of the training resources that are available through NASA's Capacity Building Program. And a bit of background, within NASA's Earth Sciences Division, is the Applied Sciences Program. And the Applied Sciences Program, they support applied research and innovative and practical uses of Earth observation satellites. Uh, and these are used to inform decision makers around the globe. Within the Applied Sciences Program lies the Capacity Building Program. And this is where our training program, RSET, resides. As additional resources within the Capacity Building Program, I also want to point out and encourage you to investigate the DEVELOP and SEVERE programs, and the URLs are right here. Um, they build capacity in Earth observations in very unique and different ways through partnerships and also through uh, USAID or the Agency on International Development, so uh, please check them out as well. Specific to RSET or the Applied Remote Sensing Training Program, uh, since 2009 RSET has worked with program managers and principal investigators from the Applied Sciences Program portfolio, as well as NASA data centers, uh, to communicate the data sets, the tools, and portals that are operationally ready to be used by water resource managers or wildlife managers and disaster relief professionals uh, around the world. We, we demonstrate to decision and policy makers and applied professionals how to access and apply Earth observations in the societal benefit areas of disasters, health and air quality, water resources management and food security, and as well as what will be presented here today, ecological forecasting or conservation. We also call this land management, uh, but in this case also for wetland man management. Our set trainings come in the form of online webinars and in-person hands-on workshops. We provide webinars typically in a series format, convening for one hour per week for four to five weeks, and these will focus on data access demonstrations and the application. We also have on-site trainings. These can be anywhere between two to seven full days where we'll partner with a certain group or of stakeholders and we'll co-produce the training materials with them with exercises and case studies that are most relevant to that particular stakeholder's organization. Um, we also have a train the trainers program uh, for anybody who's interested in conducting their own remote sensing trainings within their organization. We take a gradual approach to our trainings, first by offering a fundamentals of remote sensing. Our fundamentals webinars are available for viewing on demand, and these are intended for those with little or no remote sensing experience at all. Uh, these will cover the satellites, the sensors, and that basic terminology that will be necessary to understand many of the applications of the Earth observations going forward. Next, our level one trainings, or our basic trainings, will delve into specific applications, uh, such as an introduction to SAR, or synthetic aperture radar, or one in which we'll cover the satellites and sensors that are useful for coastal and ocean applications. Uh, then we'll move on to some of our more advanced topics, and these will detail specific data and applications by a certain region or a discipline. These advanced things will, trainings will have specific case studies and hands-on exercises uh, for participants on data access or processing of that data. 
Of particular interest to the audience today would be the training materials associated with our land management and water resources management, uh, sort of that nexus in between the two. Land management will focus on accessing and interpreting earth observation data for a variety of terrestrial applications. And these can include land cover mapping, conducting change detection, and processing vegetation indices. Our land training aid participants in the, aid, in the areas of conservation, on animal movement, phenology, and uh, such topics as carbon monitoring. To complement that, our water resources management trainings focus on access and applying remote sensing data and model-based hydrologic cycle components, as well as water quality parameters. And these components can be rainfall, soil moisture, evapotranspiration, groundwater, and in the areas of coastal oceans, inland lakes, and estuaries. To turn our attention to the remote sensing for restoration, applications of earth observations can be in the planning and monitoring phases of restoration projects. Uh, restoration projects can be in a, are in a geographical context, so spatial data and tools such as remotely sensed data and GIS can be very useful in determining the scale and the scope of restoration projects. Besides the abiotic and biotic measures, socioeconomic parameters such as human population densities, protected areas, industrial land use, private land ownership, and benefit flows can also be mapped and, and should be very well considered into the equation when, in order to determine the best course of restoration action. Earth observations can also be very useful for priority setting. And this can be done through ecosystem assessments, establishing historical baseline information, observing indicators of biodiversity, and monitoring the restoration effects over time. Although RSET has not had training specifically on restoration, topics we have covered in the past uh, can be used by practitioners of restoration in their work, uh, such as the the land trainings you see here. And if you got a, a PowerPoint of this, these links will take you right to the trainings themselves. And all these can be accessed through our website, uh, through recordings, uh, on demand, on video. Um, in the introduction to remote sensing and coastal and ocean applications training, we develop a basic understanding of the remote sensing in aquatic environments. In the introduction to remote sensing for conservation management training, we cover uh, remote sensing for conservation and biodiversity issues, and habitat monitoring. And in our advanced webinar, uh, land cover classification with satellite imagery, we walk through how to acquire Landsat Im imagery, display that in a GIS, and analyze spectral signatures on land cover types. And since we're speaking on estuaries, the water component can be brought in through training materials from our water theme, such as in the series water resource management using NASA Earth Science data. And this will provide analysis, an analysis of regional water budgets and an introduction to remote sensing of harmful algal blooms, where water quality issues that affect ecosystems and human health are addressed. Ultimately, the task at hand for ecosystem restoration practitioners is to identify the state of an ecosystem by measures of current or future threat to its function or extent, and or extent. And restoring ecosystem function and processes necessary to deliver ecosystem services is an essential goal for ecosystem restoration. Overall, the aim is to increase ecosystem integrity. The decline in ecological extent and function as compared to a reference state appropriate to that system can be measured through a number of remote sensing methods. We welcome you to check out our training materials that we already have by navigating to our website. Sign up for our listserv. And we don't send out a ton of emails a year, just a quarterly newsletter and whenever a new training is coming up. And we'll have about 16 or 17 of those a year. Um, and you'll get all the information on future trainings. We'd love to hear more about uh, hear more from you on what we can do as a program to develop our training materials to better cater to your community's needs. And just as an uh, additional resource for restoration ecologists, um, uh, 
is the thematic group on ecosystem restoration within the IUCN's Commission on Ecosystem Management. It's a great group of practitioners and researchers from around the globe with a focus on international restoration standards and policy. Uh, I'm a co-lead for this group, so please feel, re feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions on this or any of our RSET uh, training-related activities. And my contact information is listed here. My name's Brock Blevins. So uh, thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Brock. Um, and now we'll go to our next speaker, Tim Acker, who's going to talk about NASA's Giovanni system for, for accessing and analyzing some of this data. Thank you, Maggie. And as she said, my name is James Acker. You can see my email address in case you have any questions about what I'm going to talk to you today about. And what I am going to talk to you today about is our Giovanni data system. And what you see here is what you would see if you go to the Giovanni website. And you can see the URL um, at the top. But we don't think of that as very exciting. Um, what we think of it as exciting is what you can look at with Giovanni. And we have over 1,600 data variables in the system now, and they allow you to look at things like phytoplankton blooms and the emissions from volcanic eruptions, and you can look at ocean color, you can look at precipitation from hurricanes and their interactions, and we have a good host of atmospheric data as well, and this is typified by the uh, ozone hole over Antarctica. So this is the interface, and you can see on the left side a list of some of the different sources that we get the data from. And we also have our data classified in, in discipline form. So if you click in any box, you will see data related to those areas. And there's basically five areas that you need to put an input in in order to make a visualization of, of data. And the first one is you have to choose a plot type. And under these menus, we have up to, I believe, 22, and we're adding a couple more. So we're in the range of 22 to 24 different options of ways to look at the data. And I'll show a couple different ones. And then um, once you choose your data, you will see um, what the date range is. And so then you can select the date range. And we have data that's monthly. We have data that's down to hourly. So you can choose, to, based on that, your time interval. And then you can also choose the region that you're interested in. Um, you don't have to necessarily use a map and draw a box. You can also click on our shape file and choose the state of Montana, for example. Okay, and then this is one way. We call it the faceted search. You can click in an area to find um, data related to a certain discipline, or you can put in your own keyword. So you can put in chlorophyll or precipitation or uh, sea surface temperature and things like that. And once you've done that, once you've chosen your data variable or variables, you can then click on the plot data button, the green one at the bottom right, and make a plot. Okay, now here's an example. Um, this is looking at Hurricane Ermine, uh, which was making landfall on the uh, panhandle of Florida. And at the right is a visualization that averaged all the data for rainfall for the day that it made landfall. So you can see um, it came in and may have stalled a little bit when it hit land, and so it put a lot of rain on southern Georgia and northern Florida. Now another thing we have is we have a capability of overlaying data. You can overlay a lot of different types. You could put contours on top of maps. In this case, we had wind vectors from a product so you can see um, a particular snapshot. Now this is not an average. This is a, a single time increment when your mean was coming ashore, also showing the wind vectors. And one thing that it showed was the wind was um, following a strong arm of the storm that went over Tampa Bay. And so even though it was 150 miles from landfall, Tampa Bay got a good solid blow and rainfall from Hermine. And this is an animation of rainfall from tropical storm Cindy. And this is, um, this is done in Panoply. I'll mention this again. We have an animation capability as well. But this is actually showing the accumulation of rainfall from Cindy. And you can see it as it approached the shore and then moved in and put a good dose of rain over Alabama. You can also see it shows accumulating rain anywhere during this time period. 
Now, this particular area of Lake Erie tends to be a poster child for hazardous algal blooms because it was in Brock's presentation and it's in my presentation. And the reason for that is that um, the water intake for the city of Toledo, which you can see in the picture, is located very close to the shore. And this area of Lake Erie is getting a lot of algal bloom activity. And some of these are hazardous blooms. And there's a organism called microcystis that can be toxic. And in 2014, there was so much of it that they actually had to close down the drinking water supply for Toledo for a couple of days. And so what happens is the nutrients tend to come off the land and pour into the western end of Lake Erie and form a bloom. And I was curious, using some of our data types, as to what you could learn about what may have caused this to build up so high. Because they occur every year, but this was a little more intense. Now we have some things you can look at. You can look at chlorophyll concentration. You can see where the bloom area was. And this, this bloom itself was so thick that the algorithms the satellites used to interpret the data actually thought it was land. And so that's why there was. Um, but you can see the reddish areas and the greenish areas showing the concentrations um, were showing a little bit lower concentrations. And there are ways, and NOAA actually has a, a algorithm that can look through these areas and pull out the really high concentrations for a warning system. Again, I was curious about what might have caused this, and so I looked at some other data types, and this is looking at surface temperature. It's an hourly data output from a model that assimilates, brings in some types of satellite data. And in this case, you can see that the temperature was increasing up through the date of August 2nd when they had to shut down the uh, water supply. So um, the air was getting warmer, the water was getting warmer, and a couple of other data types showed that it was getting sunnier. Um, this particular data type shows cloud fraction, and the cloud fraction was actually decreasing to the point of being about as sunny as it could be um, on the day before the, the uh, shutdown of the water supply. So the, the um, algae in the water were very happily using sunlight to, to grow and produce more toxins. And then finally, I looked at a um, runoff because we know the river area called the Maumee River is what puts nutrients into the system. And there had been previous work showed that the rainfall in the winter and spring prior to summer is, sets up the conditions for worse than normal blooms. And we could really see this because there was a October bloom in 2011 that was pretty severe, and then there was this bloom in August 2014. And in both cases, you can see the peaks in the uh, surface runoff occurring in the winter and then in the spring prior to those blooms. So basically, this is one way of using a lot of different data available in our system to look at a particular effect. The health of an estuary and all of that can be derived, and you can use these in the study. And it's accessible publicly, so even citizen scientists can look at a small area and study their own um, processes and have an input from the satellites and compare it to some of the stuff they're doing in the water. Now, one other thing I'll show you is an area um, called the Chesapeake Bay, which you're probably familiar with. Um, we're uh, located quite near it. And I've done a little bit of research using Giovanni. And one of the data products that we have, which for a while was in our system, and then we had a slight change in data format, and we're putting it back in the system, and it's available in our test system, will be available publicly quite soon. And this was some experiments I did um, to look at using this product. And what it's called is euphotic depth. And another way of thinking about it is just the depth to which light can penetrate. And it's defined as the amount of light that is at a level of 1% to compared to what is the surface. So in really, really clear waters, light can penetrate 30 to 40 to 50 meters. And in really, really turbid waters with phytoplankton or sediments, it, it may only penetrate a meter or so. And so what you can do in Giovanni is you can adjust the range. And so I discovered that a good range for the Chesapeake Bay was about 2.5 meters to 15 meters. And so I made this plot. On the left, you can see Delaware Bay, Chesapeake Bay, and the sounds of North Carolina. And on the right, you can see just the Chesapeake Bay. And so this was a plot for July of 2010. And then the next thing I'll show is something that all of my staff colleagues and myself, we produce things called data recipes. And we use the data, and we'll show how to put it into other software packages, different formats, and things like that. This is a really simple use where you can put it into NASA Panoply, 
which allows you to make a difference map. And so just for fun, I compared January of 2010 in the winter to July 2010 in the summer. And then the third plot, which you can see on the right, is the difference. And looking at it very simply, you can see that it's more turbid in the upper bay and less turbid in the lower bay for July compared to January. And I think this is due to the fact that you get winds stirring up the sediments in the winter, but in the summer you have an input of nutrients constantly from the Susquehanna River, which is the biggest source of fresh water into the upper bay. So you have two different things going on. And so you can use this, you can look at this every month, and we're actually putting in eight-day data, so you can look at it at a time resolution of eight days. So that's just some ideas of how to use Giovanni, and if you have any more questions about how to use it for particular areas, you can email me. And we have a lot of different ways that you can contact us. Uh, we have a help desk where I work at the uh, GS Disk, as we call it. Uh, we have a YouTube channel that has instructional videos that we're producing. We're going to try and have one eventually for each visualization so you can see what it's useful for. And we even have a Twitter feed. And I will just mention at the end that we are doing examples of our best images made with Giovanni right now. We call it the 12 Days of Giovanni Image Hall of Fame. And that's all I have. Thanks so much, Jim. Um, and I think we're going to wait for questions at the end. So we'll go to our next speaker, um, David Agamasino, who's going to talk about some of his mapping work for coastal wetlands. <coughs> Uh, so thank you uh, for having me today. Uh, I'm going to change directions a little bit and we'll show you some of the sort of new data products that our group has been generating um, for coastal wetlands. Um, <clears throat> here you're looking at a picture of uh, about 12 years after Hurricane Wilma. This is down in, in Everglades National Park. Um, and so today I'll be talking to you about how we can measure the extent of mangrove wetlands. Um, how we can measure how it changes in, in space, how it uh, changes in, um, in the vertical direction, and how it changes through time. Um, so this is just a, a generalized schematic of our uh, mangrove land cover product. And so we, um, we composite data from uh, Landsat 8, as well as Sentinel-1, and SRTM, which is the Shuttle Radar Topography Mission. So this is elevation data that was collected in 2000. Um, and so what we do with both the Landsat and Sentinel data is we derive these quality mosaics um, and calculate a variety of different spectral indices in addition to um, um, the band values. Um, and this is all with, done within Google Earth Engine. Uh, so with that, we apply a a classifier um, uh, which groups those different spectra and spectral indices together into different land cover classes. Uh, we then do some masking to remove out some of the uh, uh, terrestrial pixels that sometimes pop up, uh, and then we can get at a mangrove extent. Uh, we also do um, uh, land cover change, and so this is um, an example of how we may look at change from 2000 to 2016. Um, here again, we're using the, the Landsat archive. Um, and so we're using every um, image in the Landsat archive after we screen for clouds uh, and shadows. And so what we do here is we develop a, a baseline period. Um, here I'm showing you an example from 1990 to 2000. Um, but this can be variable of when you want to start your, your actual baseline. And then you have the, the, the series that you want to look at. Um, and here we're looking at 2001 to 2016. Um, and so we de derive these different metrics. Uh, one is uh, this NDVI, which is the Normalized Different Vegetation Index. And this can give you a, a sense of um, the level of greenness of, of, the, uh, of the landscape. So we derive an average, and then we derive uh, this uh, indice for all of the other um, images in the collection. Um, then we determine uh, this change anomaly, and then we decide on these percentile thresholds. And what that does in the end is able to separate out um, areas that have gained over time, areas that have been lost, and then as well as areas that have been degraded 
and how they have recovered over that 16-year period. So here we're looking at two examples. Uh, the one on the bottom left is in Senegal, and the one on the top right uh, is in the northern parts of Peru. In black, you see the uh, extent of mangrove wetlands in 2016. Uh, in green, you'll see the areas of gain. Uh, in red, uh, you'll see areas of loss. And then in blue, again, is this uh, sort of this regeneration from wetlands that were once degraded but have now sort of been, um, have grown healthier uh, over the past 16 years. And here I'm showing you a plot of some of the examples of how we can tell um, these degraded areas from uh, sort of regenerated areas. Um, so on the x-axis, I'm showing you time. And on the y-axis, we're looking at that normalized difference vegetation index, or that level of greenness. So what you can see is uh, a value of zero or less is usually water. Um, around 0.2 is kind of mud or soils. And then everything above a 0.3 can be sort of considered vegetation. So what we see in the orange, <coughs> sorry, in, in the uh, red line is we start off with a vegetated mangrove forest in the 80s and 90s. And then about 2005, Hurricane uh, Katrina and Wilma passed through South Florida. And it degraded the system, and it hasn't been able to recover since. When we look in the orange, we see a sort of a, a longer chronic um, degradation of the system as it's moved from a sort of patchy vegetation to now a flooded uh, mudflat. Conversely, we can also look at the at areas of gain or the areas that have been recovered. Um, so again, we still have it's the same axis, so um, time on the on the x-axis and this level of greenness on the y. So if we look at the green line, uh, it starts in water. So this is an open water body. And in about 2000, 2001, um, that body of water starts to transition into uh, a mudflat. And then eventually, about 2007, 2008, it becomes a full-fledged forest. So we can see that the, the expansion of mangroves can happen very quickly um, over a matter of a few years. And in the white, we see sort of these um, ups and downs. And these are all associated with different either freeze events for um, these wetlands or major hurricanes. Um, so in the early 90s, we had a freeze event, Hurricane Andrew in 1992, uh, another hurricane in, in 1997, and then uh, 2005, Katrina and Wilma, 2010, another freeze event, and most recently, we just had Hurricane Irma pass through. So we'll expect to see a similar uh, decrease in this metric. So what we can do with that is start to look at the spatial variability uh, across these coastal wetlands. So here um, you're seeing South Florida with Miami, uh, the Miami metropolitan area off to the, off to the right. Um, and so in red, we can start to identify areas that have been degraded or eroded through, um, through wave erosion as well as we can start to see the expansion of mangroves into freshwater marshes, the recovery from different um, hurricane disturbances, as well as new growth uh, on these mangrove islands in, in Florida Bay. In addition to that, we're also looking at um, the three-dimensional structure of these mangrove forests. And so we've been using uh, commercial high-resolution stereo data uh, to get at sub-meter um, canopy height information, um, and that's what I'm showing you here, uh, where we go from uh, green to red, and that's increasing canopy height. So we're able to map sort of the three-dimensional structure across large areas of coastal wetlands. And ultimately what we're doing with this is throwing all of this information uh, into sort of a total risk uh, aggregation. Um, and so we have elements of, of drought, of cropland expansion, of urban areas, uh, erosion, and, and, um, and loss and gain uh, to calculate this sort of total risk. Here I'm showing you some examples we have for Everglades National Park, as well as uh, Senegal there on the, on the right. Um, and we can see as 
uh, red being the most uh, total or at risk areas and green being much lower risk. Uh, and here is a demonstration. Can you hit play on that, please? So this is a demonstration of the tool that we're developing um, up a little bit. And so what we do here is, so we can click on a certain location. This gives us information about that, that vegetation index. Um, it provides us what different risk factors uh, exist at that particular location, gives us a vulnerability. It provides a timeline information of changes in, in that forest indice. Um, but then we can switch back between these other risks. So here we're looking at erosion risks. Uh, we see much higher risk uh, along the shorelines, but then we can also see where there's potential growth. Um, and so in these, um, we could start to see where areas are growing or where things are, are starting to be lost. Um, we have a website, mangrovescience.org. Um, at this website, we have information about uh, the different projects that we have going on, not only in South Florida, but in Africa and Southeast Asia. Um, but we also have a data portal. And at that data portal, you can click on um, these different site locations, and that links you out directly to um, our, our data product archives, where you can then download the data. Uh, and that, again, is mangrove extent, change, uh, and three-dimensional height. And lastly, this is just um, Again, I'm showing you some areas where you can get data products and, and contact information. The top is our website. The second one is uh, one of our airborne sensors. We've collected lots of data over South Florida. Um, the third link uh, provides um, a link to a user guide that we've developed uh, to measure uh, mangrove extent and change. Thank you. Thanks so much, David. So now we're going to go across the country to our colleague Mark Jamar at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, and he's actually going to talk about his work in the Mississippi Delta. Okay. So, and Mark, you I'm should be getting control of me. the presenter. Okay. So I'm presenting from my own, uh, uh, from here, right? Yes, uh, you should be able to take control now. Okay. Yes, I got the button here. Okay. So, can you see my screen now? Yes. You look good. Great. Uh, so, my as uh, um, my introduction said, uh, I'm Mark Simard at Jet Propulsion Laboratory, so in, uh, in California. Uh, we've had uh, already two campaigns in the Mississippi Delta, so I'll be talking a little bit about that and what we can do uh, with our uh, set of uh, instruments on, uh, that are installed on aircraft. Uh, the campaigns occurred in 2015 and 16, uh, in particular in the Wax Lake outlet area in the Atchafalaya River, if you know, uh, that's in uh, southern Louisiana, part of the Mississippi Delta Plain. Uh, first, I, I start with uh, the takeaways. Uh, whoops, something happened here. So, uh, the the objectives as a whole. I'm sorry, <laughs> I have an issue here. The objectives as a whole. Can you see my screen? I'm sorry, I have a bug. Uh, we've lost your slides for a minute. I've lost it too. <laughs> okay, because the uh, the, the go-to webinar is actually on top of my slides, so I don't know why that's happening. Anyway, so uh, we're trying to understand the flow of water, sediments, and carbon through uh, the coastal wetland area. So that's at the interface of uh, the discharge of uh, the rivers and the ocean. So we're looking at those wetlands and how water circulates uh, with its sediments and carbon in that interface. Uh, for that, uh, uh, 
overall, we're trying to assess the vulnerability and the resilience of these coastal ecosystems to climate change, sea levels, and uh, human impact. Of course, uh, this is all driven by how this water, sediments, and carbon are flowing through uh, these wetlands. So we're trying to monitor that using uh, remote sensing. So for that, we have three instruments which are installed on three different aircrafts. We actually have these aircrafts flying simultaneously over uh, the wetlands. Uh, each of them has a different um, uh, measurement, so I will be uh, telling you about that. And what that allows us to do is to uh, calibrate models, so hydrology and uh, ecosystem productiv productivity models in uh, the wetlands. And these uh, calibrated models are expected to be delivered uh, for uh, hopefully soon. Uh, to uh, end users, which includes stakeholders, managers, and uh, other scientists. So these are, are our three aircraft. So we have the UAV SAR instrument. It's uh, it's a, it's called UAV, but it's actually uh, piloted. There's it's a G3 with two pilots. So this is a radar system with a six meter spatial resolution. We use that to map shallow bathymetry, so the new channels that are created. Uh, under the water, so and uh, we also use that to map carbon stocks, so biomass of uh, the ecosystem, whether it's marshes or mangroves, uh, and we also use that same system uh, with a different technique, but still radar, uh, to map the flow of water within the marshes. So we can actually measure the the changes in water level within the marshes using that aircraft. So as the tide comes in and out, we can actually see the, the water moving through the system. So the second instrument is AirSWAT. So that's a new instrument that uh, we designed here. Uh, it is a simulator for a future NASA mission and uh, called SWAT. Uh, it has a four meter spatial resolution. And this one we use to estimate the flow of water in the rivers and the channels. So UAVSAR was used, is used for mapping uh, water circulation to, uh, in the marshes, but air SWAT is in open water surfaces. So we can measure water level as well as slope of the rivers. And it is from that slope of the rivers uh, that we can estimate the discharge of the river. Uh, then the third instrument, all of these are fl flying in similar, uh, simultaneous, uh, they are flying simultaneously over the wetlands. So Avris NG is an imaging spectrometer. It has uh, 425 bands plus seven that are used uh, for different uh, flags, uh, but it gives us a full spec for each four meter pixel. It gives us a full spectrum of the target, so it's very good for mapping vegetation species, uh, very precise and detailed, uh, as well as their structure. So we're using it for mapping uh, vegetation, but also for mapping water quality. So we're able to estimate the total suspended sediment as well as carbon concentrations within uh, the open water surfaces like channels, lagoons, uh, ponds. Uh, so we're able to estimate that. So it has uh, fairly uh, good use there. So if we're able to measure discharge uh, using air SWAT uh, and we know what's in the water, then we can figure out not only where the water is going, but what the water brings with it. So the sediments, which are important for uh, assessing the vulnerability and resilience of these uh, ecosystems. Uh, of course, we have also the in-situ measurements uh, for uh, CalVal purposes. So these are um, uh, precursors, they're airborne precursors to future spaceborne missions that will be launched in 2021. Uh, but these type of very dynamic systems like uh, coastal uh, wetlands, because of the tide, these daily tides that impact the system, it is much better to uh, study them with uh, airborne remote sensing. It's much more powerful, but still we can uh, try to improve uh, our measurement that will be achieved through spaceborne uh, data. So this is uh, what was covered in 2015 and 16 using air SWAT. So on the on uh, west uh, here uh, we have the Wax Lake Delta and the Atchafalaya River. The Mississippi is a little bit more uh, on the east here of uh, that image. So with air SWAT we're able to measure water surface slope which is a pretty amazing measurement. This is uh, revolutionary I must say. We're able to uh, resolve 
slopes in the order of one centimeter every kilometer. So a, a small change in elevation, this one centimeter of change every kilometer is being measured by air SWOT. And this is what actually uh, determines the discharge of the river. So we use that to constrain the models, so to make uh, the hydrological models much much more realistic. Uh, this is uh, the measurements from uh, UAVSAR. So this is the Wax Lake outlet. So the delta is here on the west. Uh, on the west, actually, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, the orientation is, uh, is uh, on the right is north uh, to south. Uh, so the the changes in color that you see here every half hour show the water level change in the marshes. So what we're seeing is the connectivity between the channels of the wetland and uh, the marshes themselves. So we see where they're connected and that connection is extremely important for resilience of this system. This is how the channel network is feeding sediments into the marshes so that they, they can keep up with sea level rise. So these areas have never been seen before. So this is uh, this is a very important result and observation. Uh, with UAVSAR, the same system that we use to get those water level changes in the marshes and uh, figure out where the connectivity happens, uh, we also use to get uh, above ground biomass so the productivity of these ecosystem. So you can see uh, very large gradients going from the west to the east, uh, going from about uh, almost 10,000 10, uh, grams per meter square down to uh, almost uh, a few hundred grams per meter square on the eastern side. So the, the ecosystems in the Wax Lake Atchafalaya area are much more productive than the ones in the Turbone Bay area, if uh, you know that area. So uh, these uh, measurements, these remote sensing measurements, are used to constrain the hydrology model. So with these hydrology model, we can have a spatially explicit assessment of the ecosystem vulnerability uh, and resilience. So instead of making these big ballpark estimates of how much uh, how much uh, land will be lost uh, or uh, using uh, just uh, remote sensing, we can actually calibrate this model to be very uh, to uh, to be very accurate and give us a spatially explicit forecast of which part of the deltas will uh, be at risk uh, to sea level rise. It can be used for also for uh, management to uh, improve uh, their resilience. So here's uh, the last results I'm going to show. So since we have this charge, uh, which is uh, the one here on uh, the left, we're able to estimate water discharge and we know what's in the water, then it's possible for us to look at the transport of sediments throughout the entire system. So these are the colors that you see here and they're estimates of the, the fluxes of these sediments uh, through the system. So for example, here you have 149 kilos of sediments passing through this branch uh, every second. Uh, that's a lot of sediments here. So again, takeaways, that's a copy paste of uh, the, the previous slide. So we're trying to understand the flow of water, sediments and carbon. We're actually able to uh, estimate it using a mix between a hydrology model and uh, remote sensing measurements. Uh, these remote sensing measurements, again, we do with uh, three aircraft flying simultaneously, and uh, we're expecting to deliver these calibrated models to uh, end users, and uh, hopefully we'll make great use of it. Uh, so for more information, you can contact me, so Mark Simard at JPL, here's my, uh, w my email address. Uh, so currently we've only done this in the Wax Lake Atchafalaya River. We're hoping to do this in uh, other areas in the near future. Uh, it's possible to get these uh, airplanes to fly wherever you want, of course, if you have the money for it, uh, or you go through a, the NASA proposal pro process, uh, which uh, actually uh, funds these uh, kind of campaigns. Um, and I have to warn you, sometimes uh, some of this data may require some expert processing before use, but uh, some of that data that we've already acquired is anyway 
available here on these websites in particular for the UAV SAR and the Avris NG system. So it takes, uh, once we collect the data somewhere, it appears on those websites within a week. So it's there for free. And I will stop here. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. <coughs> I'm going to pass the control back to you, Maggie. Sure thing. So we'll come back to the East Coast now. Um, so our last speaker is Nima Palawan, who's going to talk about water quality, <coughs> and in particular using remote sensing to look at water quality anomalies. Um, yeah, um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for inviting me over. Um, so I would like to, um, if you go to the next slide, do I, oh, okay, I have the control. Oh, okay, fantastic. Um, so today I would like to promote a, um, a satellite-based near real-time water quality monitoring system that we have started working on over the past uh, couple of uh, months. Um, I would like to... Um, well, essentially start by telling you what I'll be presenting in the next uh, 10 minutes. Uh, I'll start with, uh, with, a, and with an introduction um, and I'll tell you where we are right now with all the satellite data that we have that we can do water quality and uh, near real time um, alerting system and uh, where we want it to be in uh, the near future uh, with this uh, tool. So uh, this, is a, this is my favorite uh, snapshot of uh, Landsat 8 uh, derived um, to a visitor product over Boston Harbor. You see amount of data, the, you know, providing uh, um, uh, gazillions of information uh, related to uh, different parts of the harbor, and uh, this is scale. Uh, what I would like to highlight here is that um, uh, although satellite data provide uh, a significant amount of data in terms of the uh, general um, the variability, spatial variability in uh, water turbidity and water quality, uh, they do not necessarily by themselves uh, provide uh, high detailed information. The detailed information comes from um, uh, field data, uh, and there is, uh, however, there's a lot of effort and time uh, and money goes into these kind of field uh, um, uh, sampling. So what, I'm, we're, what we're promoting here is not a sort of replacement for institute data collection. It's essentially we're trying to complement what, what happens uh, in the field and try to sort of uh, combine institute data with uh, satellite data and provide, uh, you know, um, uh, simplified uh, tools uh, to the end users. So uh, just a brief background on aquatic remote sensing. It's very intuitive. The, uh, the plot to the uh, right corner, you're seeing to the, to the lower right corner, it's, uh, they are um, the spectra of the surface, of surface reflectance, and uh, they're simply uh, indicating each spectra, each, each set of spectra um, uh, correspond to water type. Uh, the blue type of spectrum essentially corresponds to the blue uh, water, the more like a cyanish, uh, uh, kind of milky, uh, sort of correspond to the uh, milky water to the left, and the more, um, uh, the um, the areas with, with more sediment load, it sort of uh, tend to have a, a sort of a red, uh, yellow type of uh, reflected light. So essentially, what we're seeing is uh, from satellite is very intuitive, and it's it's correspond it does correspond with uh, what um, we see at, at different sites. So where are we uh, right now? And essentially, uh, what I would like to tell you in the next few slides is. Um, what has made us to think about uh, um, developing this uh, near real-time water quality monitoring tool. Uh, the main thing, the first thing is, is the data, uh, availability of free data to us. And that essentially starts with Landsat 8, which was launched in 2013. Uh, currently we have also Landsat, Sentinel 2A and Sentinel 2B, uh, as well as Sentinel 3A um, in, the, in operations by European Space Agency, ESA. Uh, the, the range of spatial resolution uh, is from 20 to 10, 20, 10 or 20 meter to 300 meter. Uh, the revisit time for all these uh, satellite data combined is down to uh, essentially one day if, if we consider Sentinel-3 in, in conjunction with Landsat-8 and Sentinel-2. So the frequency of uh, revisit uh, is, is really high 
and it allows us to capture all the uh, dynamics of water quality in different uh, in lakes, reservoirs, and near shore coastal areas, etc. Uh, not only data quantity, but also data quality has has been improved because of the uh, uh, improvement technology. Uh, so this is a uh, um, one single comparison of uh, Landsat 5 and Landsat 7, uh, as well as Landsat 8 and Sentinel 2A uh, products over Boston Harbor, and you see that the 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 the, um, the uh, amazing sort of uh, quality of data from Landsat 8 and Sentinel 2 compared to heritage emissions like Landsat 5 and 7. So it's not just high the quality, the the quantity, but also the uh, quality of the data has improved significantly. Uh, so what, how do we process these, these images, these data? How do we get down to turbidity or chlorophyll concentration? Uh, we, uh, we essentially have, a, have already a software suite available at NASA Goddard, uh, developed by our Ocean Color or Ocean Ecology Lab. Um, and it's, it's, there's like two, three decades of research uh, essentially going, goes into this uh, tool. And we use this tool to process Landsat 8, Sentinel 2A, B, and Sentinel-3 data. Uh, so it's quite flexible, it's, it's, it's available out there, but we as expert users of these satellite products, we provide, we process them and we provide them to end users um, at this point. So the, the process data for Landsat 8, Sentinel-2 are not currently available out there, um, and we're trying to essentially, by creating that tool, we're trying to simplify end user access uh, uh, to these uh, data products. Uh, so. There's also, um, at, at NASA Goddard, we also have access to um, existing arch architectures for uh, near real-time uh, anomaly detection tools. Uh, one example is the, uh, the near real-time near real tool that we have available for fire detection based on MODIS and VIRS data. So we're sort of um, using that uh, architecture to develop this near real-time water quality tool. So we have the software, we have the architecture for near real-time um, alerting system, as well as the data, uh, data uh, satellite data. So we can go ahead and uh, think about developing a system uh, which uh, issues uh, alert to end users um, about any anomalies in uh, their region of interest. Uh, so to build this, essentially the goal to build this, as I pointed out, is, is, is to simplify integration of satellite data products into decision making. Because we know that non-expert end users do, do not want to bother with, uh, you know, dealing with uh, satellite data, processing them, and get things right, and uh, all that. Uh, uh, so this tool is essentially to, to facilitate the, the way end users get to the data. So there is no need for training for this system. It just sends out an email and alert uh, to the end user and decision makers. And the main functionality is the anomaly detection. So when, when the system uh, notifies an anomaly, then it uh, sends an alert in, in form of an email to end user registered on the system, and uh, they can take uh, appropriate action. The base products for this system would, could be um, uh, total suspended solids, TFS, turbidity, clarity, chlorophyll or maximum chlorophyll index, uh, but the choice is limited by the type of satellite sensor. For Landsat 8, for instance, we can do maximum chlorophyll index because we don't have the spectral bands to do it. Um, uh, so it's, it's sort of it's on us to decide which uh, set of products we use for uh, anomaly detection. So our current plan is to do the prototyping for the system for over selected sites across the U.S. Um, uh, we we want to do uh, we, we want to process Landsat 8 and Sentinel 2 data retrospectively, and validate uh, the anomalies that we're seeing against the uh, historic data, in, historic in situ data. Um, and for those selected regions, we would we would like to set up the system uh, uh, in a, in a form that we can uh, provide expedited uh, services or expedited uh, alert. Uh, for these uh, for these areas. So uh, as a result, we're looking for partners to be able to validate the system and see how well we're essentially detecting these anomalies. Uh, the current sites that we have in mind are uh, Lake Mead, Milford Lake in Kansas, um, Indian River Lagoon in Florida, uh, Oregon Reservoirs, and Ohio River and southern uh, shores of Lake Erie, uh, as well as a few other um, areas. Uh, so this is one example that I'm showing here. There is no alerting uh, or there is no 
uh, water quality monitoring going on here. It's just a simply one um, uh, data extraction of uh, total suspended solids and chlorophyll uh, uh, products uh, from Landsat 8 and Sentinel-2 over Lake Eustis uh, in Florida. And what I would like to highlight here is the consistency amongst uh, between the two sensors, uh, the, the products coming out of the two sensors essentially. And uh, we're, I'm highlighting uh, through the in the in the lower uh, chart where chlorophyll A uh, time series are shown uh, that we can detect, easily detect anomalies in chlorophyll concentration using these plots, uh, you know, compared to um, a baseline or average value over time. So this is the type of thing that we're going to be doing for each site and for each even pixel to be able to detect these kind of anomalies we're seeing. Uh, so that's basically all I had. And um, again, I, we're looking for partners to help us to validate this tool. And I would like to also to emphasize that uh, there is no replacement and such with, with satellite data for in-situ data. They go together, uh, um, satellite data essentially just complementing uh, what uh, field technicians do and uh, get uh, for uh, for um, monitoring purposes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nima. So I think we'll pass it back to you, Stephanie, uh, to moderate the questions. Yes, um, thank you, Maggie, and thank you to all of our speakers. Um, we've got a couple of questions from the question box and from um, some emails sent in. Um, so we'll get started with the first one. Um, is there anyone at NASA working on salinity predictive modeling? Um, I think. Yeah, not that I know of. The there was a satellite um, sensor um, on Aquarius, but that was more open ocean for climate modeling. So it. It would be more, you'd have to look at some type of input of runoff or precipitation into um, an estuarine model, something like that. Yeah, that's one where we could get back to you on that. Okay, great. Um, there was another question um, that was sent in. Let me bring that up real quick. Um, is there an effort like mangrove sciences for northern uh, non-mangrove tidal marshes? I think uh, that would be to David. Yes. Uh, so I'm. I don't think there's uh, anything set up like that. The NASA developed program here at Goddard, um, which is sort of um, uh, a a ten-week program here, where a team gets to work on. Um, certain applications for stakeholders, they were working on um, a very similar type application for the Chesapeake Bay. And they were looking at salt marshes and changes in salt marshes look, using very similar algorithms that we've applied to um, um, for mangrove wetlands. Um, however, I don't think there's any sort of uh, larger effort that I know of on the remote sensing side um, that's similar to, to what we have for mangrove science. Um, well, that said, our, our methodology is available through that user guide that I mentioned, um, and others can, can try to implement that for, for coastal wetlands. Yeah, so this is uh, Mark Simard. So we uh, actually, we may not be doing maybe as much as uh, David was showing for uh, the mangrove forest, but we had a project, uh, carbon monitoring system project, uh, in collaboration with the USGS, in which uh, we've estimated the carbon stocks in uh, tidal wetlands, so in the marshes, in several sites across the US, which includes uh, the Mississippi Delta, Chesapeake Bay, San Francisco Bay, uh, among other uh, sites. And uh, so we've done a carbon mapping exercise in those areas. We have not done any uh, land cover and land use change uh, yet in those areas, though. And building off of that question, um, the remap demonstration slides that David showed, um, are those accessed through that mangrove science uh, data portal, or is there another way to access to be able to uh, make visualizations like that?
Uh, would that be for uh, David? Yes. David, you yeah, may be on mute. David. Sorry, we're back. So the 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 video that I showed um, is not available yet. We are presenting the the results of that um, next week at AGU. Um, and so we're it's still sort of in uh, testing phase, and it's not it's not uh, open or public yet. Um, but we do hope to have some remnants of of that um, available, um, probably starting um, about the middle of next year. Great, thanks. Um, we have another question. Uh, are there applications for submerged vegetation? Um, submerged ve vegetation. Um, that's a tricky one from satellites, from the current satellite that we have. Um, the only one has, has potential to enable um, robust and precise or accurate um, submerged vegetation retrieval would be Sentinel-3 data, which is at about 300 meter resolution. I know for many areas that's not a, um, an adequate uh, special resolution. Um, but still, with Landsat 8 and Sentinel 2, there is there is um, it's possible to be able to do some um, SAV retrievals. Um, but the the accuracy and precision from those maps are kind of um, not quite uh, validated. Um, so there is potential, but there is a lot of limitations for the use of Landsat 8 and Sentinel 2 in those uh, type of applications. Great, thank you. Uh, our next question uh, is if there is any directory of information for other continents, specifically uh, Senegal or other West Africa coastal uh, areas. Um, this question is also specifically if there's um, information on sea level rise for the coast and estuaries of West Africa. Um, so we have, uh, there's data available for, for Senegal. Um, and um, our group here has just been funded uh, to work on the west, uh, the rest of West Africa. Um, so over the course of the next couple of years, uh, we'll be developing uh, similar type models, both of the, the extent, change, uh, and height um, for for mangroves, at least in um, in West Africa. But that's not on the table quite yet. So I know there's NASA Severe, um, the West Africa hub is starting to to open up, and and they may start to have some um, some data sets available. Great, and we have I think it's more of a comment that's come in um, relating to uh, salinity predictive modeling. Um, it seems maybe the DELF uh, 3D model that was shown on the slide may also show salinity. If someone could comment on that. Yeah, I think uh, we are not planning on doing modeling of uh, the salinity gradients of uh, the area, but I, I think there could be some work uh, that could be done with Delft 3D. Uh, however, that, however that's, not, that's not really part of uh, our modeling effort currently, unfortunately. Um, a question for, I think, Brock, um, if there is a fee to attend any of the NASA training programs that were mentioned? Uh, no, completely open, completely free, as is the NASA data. So uh, we're very happy to let uh, anybody come in. We, anytime we do have to cap a webinar series just because we just can't fit as many people into a webinar room, sometimes they have capacities. Uh, we will sometimes curtail that towards those who are working in an operational sense, applied users, uh, versus, um, say, a, a grad student or somebody in, in academia as a student. Uh, but uh, that happens very rarely. So um, please uh, sign up. They're all free. Great. Great resource to have. Uh, and we also had a comment come in about the Giovanni link that was provided on the slides. Um, I think folks were having trouble accessing that. Um, so if, uh, if uh, I, 
don't know if Jim, if you have a comment to that, or if I could get the correct um, link from you to share one with thing that, If you're able to see it, I think there was an SCI in it that's not necessary. That might have been what's throwing it off. It can the URL can simply be giovanni.gsfc.nasa.gov. Okay, great, thanks. And I and I will Probably also include that in the I'll include that in the follow up email to all of our registrants. Okay. If they search and for NASA Giovanni on Google, they'll get it. <laughs> great. <laughs> um, and is there a good resource uh, for staying informed about future webinars um, on on future NASA webinars? Um, well, I can I can speak to um, yes. There is a, um, a mailing list for NASA RSED, and many of these resources. Um, we've started our own for NASA Goddard. Uh, we have a, a monthly newsletter um, about the uh, upcoming events and resources, and um, for example, sessions at upcoming relevant meetings. Um, so for that, you can contact me, um, and my colleagues can can add you to the list. Yeah, and Maggie mentioned our our list serve, um, but yeah, besides our set, there's there's a lot of training activities and videos um, like the ones uh, Jim puts on uh, through Giovanni and, and that data center. So um, I don't know if you guys have a list, or we have a Twitter account, so maybe you guys point to a lot of your resources there, your data recipes. Um, you can get the data recipes partly through NASA Earth Data. They have a directory, and um, you can search them on our site, but we're still putting together a new website, so I'm not sure of the exact address. Great. Thank you. And uh, I, can, I will work with all of our NASA speakers today to put together a list of links and resources mentioned on today's webinar and share that in the follow-up email to all of our registrants. Um, we're about out of time, so I just want to thank all of our speakers again. And if you have a question that wasn't answered or think of something else, you can email either myself or Maggie. Our emails are on the screen. And we will be posting a recording of this webinar and a copy of slides afterwards. So again, thank you, Maggie, thank, for organizing. Thank you, all of our speakers. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you.